welcome to the Aerospace Advantage Podcast. I'm your host, John Slick Bell. Here on the Aerospace Advantage Podcast, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and subject matter experts to explore the intersection between strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, thank you so much for coming back. And if it's your first time, we really appreciate you joining us. Okay, so this week it's time for the Rendezvous edition. It's our monthly installment where the Mitchell team digs into stories that you may have seen in the headlines. And this week we have General Deptula. Hey, Slick, how you doing? I'm doing great, sir. Thanks for being here. We also have Heather Penny. Thanks, Slick. Great to be back. Great to have you, Heather. And Doug Berkey. Hey, man. And last but not least, we have Lucas Ottenried here with us today. Hey, Slick. Great to be here. Awesome. Well, General Deptula, we'll get started with you. Uh, understand that you had Secretary Kendall uh, here this week, and it was the first Mitchell Institute dinner of 2022. So how did that go? Yeah, well, thanks, Slick. Uh, we did host Department of the Air Force Secretary this past uh, Monday, and it was a great event. But in, in all honesty, we conduct these dinners off the record so we can create an environment that encourages a candid conversation for our guests. Uh, but all that said, an item or items of interest that the audience ought to be aware of, if they're not already, is that uh, Secretary Kendall recently uh, spoke publicly about his seven operational imperatives These are focus areas that he is going to spend attention on during his uh, tenure. So I thought what I'd do is share those with the audience uh, for folks who aren't familiar with them. Uh, So first is creating a resilient space order of battle. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into every one of these in detail. I just want to hit the highlights so that folks understand um, where his cranium's aimed at. Uh, Second is actualizing the Advanced Battle Management System, or ABMS, as the Air Force's contribution to joint all-domain command and control. And third is the Next Generation Air Dominance Program, defining in more clarity what else needs to be developed beyond an advanced uh, platform that's the follow-on to the uh, F-22. Then fourth Achieving moving target engagement at scale. Here, think about GMTI, ground moving target indicator, uh, and uh, how are we going to deal with that uh, in a post-E8 environment. Fifth is resilient basing. I think everyone's aware of the, the vulnerabilities of bases by increasing numbers of Chinese accurate missiles. Uh, And so this includes concepts like Agile Combat Employment or ACE. Uh, Sixth is evaluating readiness of the Department of the Air Force to transition to a wartime posture against a peer competitor. Think China again. And then seventh and the final imperative focuses on modernizing uh, the Air Force's global strike capabilities or defining further the B-21 long-range strike family of systems. So now there's a lot to discuss there, and I'm going to be hosting Secretary Kendall on an Aerospace Nation event for public remarks on the 15th of February. So I encourage our audience to sign up for that event to hear more about these focus areas. Absolutely. And sir, uh, we'll definitely make sure that we put that in the show notes so folks can tune into that. And of course, such importance uh, that we have the connectivity to the senior leaders that we do. So appreciate that. Doug, I want to switch over to you quickly. We've spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill, and I know that we've talked about that on the show before, but you really have worked extensively with Congress. And it's a, a real item of interest that looms over all defense issues is the status of the budget, especially the defense budget. So the National Defense Authorization Act It passed uh, at the end of 2021, but the appropriations bill stalled out. So we've discussed this before, but that means that we are in a continuing resolution and it's going to lock down our funding at levels that we had last year. And as I understand it, the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Brown, and Chief of Space Operations, General Raymond, spoke about this recently. So what were their main messages and what's your view on, uh, on what's going on here? No, I appreciate it. And I just want to build off what General Deptula is saying about the Secretary's imperatives. A really important thing about those is that for a while now, the Air Force has focused a lot on opening the aperture for a lot of new ideas, which is good. you got to do that occasionally. However, there comes a point where you have to snap the chalk line, pick some winners, and get it done. 
and that's what the secretary is doing. And this is very encouraging. And and the tone he's taken on these is uh, is something that I think we all find very heartening. And this is good stuff. But back to your question, you know. So well, we've talked a lot before in past episodes. Remember authorization, and that's uh, with the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee. That's what they pass each year, and that's permission to spend money. But the appropriators give you the actual money. And they're two separate bills, and it's all about balancing power and not over-concentrating. And so the authorization, like I said, it passed in December. But the Appropriations Act, which goes off the fiscal year for the government, so that's one October, that never passed. And so this is four months now where the new allotment of cash never went over to the respective agencies in, in government, including DOD. And so that means they're actually locked into the previous year's funding streams. And this is a huge, huge problem. I mean, just think about where we were a year ago. I mean, heck, Afghanistan was still going on. That means those accounts are still locked in where there's still an account, uh, you know, for Afghan security forces. That's over $3 billion. There's a wedge for it. And yet here we are in a radically different world looking at challenges like Ukraine. We've got all these new authorizations that, that need to come to play for for new star programs and, and it's a mess so you're right they held a hearing house appropriations committee held a hearing about this and you had all the service chiefs and you also had the pentagon comptroller mike mccord so big picture takeaways from a dod wide perspective is that if we go into a full year continuing resolution which is a risk right now that they just don't pass a bill that's going to cost the department about $8 billion directly due to the difference between the, the two years and, and what was programmed. If you look at the inefficiencies that drives and all the other challenges, that actually escalates to about a $24 billion impact. Now, the services are already getting hammered by inflation. I mean, here's an example. They've had to renegotiate fuel contracts twice thus far in the new fiscal year just because of the escalating prices. That has increased their bill by a billion dollars. And that's something that they got to eat out of hide. That is a lot of money, even in Pentagon math land. And then if you look at the notion of continuing resolutions in general, they're happening more frequently. I mean, from 1991 to 2010, the average you know, appropriate bill was about 24 days after the, the start of the fiscal year. It's, it's still in October, not a big deal. The next 12 years saw this delayed out 180 days. And the six longest periods all occurred in, in that window. And so this is a problem that's getting worse at the very time that the demand cycle, China and everything else is escalating, the budget pressures, the sequestration, we're making things tough. So we're just being less efficient, less effective at a time when we need to, to increase on, on both of those to the favorable. So if you look Air Force specific, their math suggests that a year-long continuing resolution would impact them for about $3.5 billion worth of funding. And, and to break that down, yeah, it's about a year's worth of F-35s that we normally buy. So it's real money. You know, it's going to reduce flying hours. It's going to reduce new construction. It's going to impact things like maintenance. Um, you're not going to be able to begin upgrade programs. And if you look at the number of programs we are currently slated to buy and, and to develop, those are all things that change markedly year to year, like B-21. You know, the program was one thing last year. It's a very different thing this year. Same with GBSD or Next Generation Fighter. They are moving rapidly. If you do not shift the cash accordingly, they fall apart. It's like building a house. You know, once you put the walls up, the demands are very different when you're putting the plumbing in and, and electrical, and, and you got to adjust to that. Otherwise, you're just stuck in a very inefficient spin. And then Space Force-wise, it's about a $2 billion impact. It delays two launches by a year. And it's, again, it hits a ton of programs, the very ones we don't want to hit. Missile warning and tracking, you know, space domain awareness, the whole defensive architecture to, to make our orbits more survivable, the assets up there. So, you know, I could go on, but bottom line, this is stupid in a time when, when we really can't afford this. And most importantly, we're surrendering the advantage of time. And that is something that we can never buy back again. And we're already too short on that. Yeah, well, dovetailing right into that. So how is this going to impact fiscal year 23 with that budget submission from the executive branch to Congress? 
You know, so like, let me jump in here just to build off of everything that Doug said is that this is going to have compounding errors. If you think about um, how the DOD, the Air Force, the Space Force are going to be unable in fiscal year 2022 to do the things that they need to do for all of those various programs for readiness, for sustainment, for maintenance, for personnel and so forth. So every time a CR gets extended, the Air Force then has to take everything that they haven't done into account and then basically replan for FY23. So they're going to be going through these budget drills over and over and over. And so not only are they just, you know, are they having to continually recalculate, you know, it's like when you get the blue screen of death or, you know, the, the little circle that goes around recalculating. But bottom line, like what Doug said, is that this is about time. We are losing time. And we all know how inefficient the DOD acquisition process is, um, how, how challenged we are to develop and field capabilities rapidly uh, when we're talking about innovation. And these are all things that are just sort of baked into the system when it's working properly. Now we have Congress introducing these compounding errors through these continual resolutions, and it only is it's a self-inflicted wound. Yeah, Heather, I appreciate you hopping in. I want to open the floor here for any other uh, thoughts from the panelists. On the, on the Space Force uh, specifically, I think the, uh, the CR is an absolute killer. You know, as General Raymond recently pointed out, the, the Space Force had about a month to put its first budget submission together, so that was a bit of a wash. Uh, so this year is the, the first real budget submission that the service has been able to submit uh, that reflects sort of the, the new direction the Space Force wants to take. And, you know, one of the major reasons for standing up the service was the need to rapidly field new warfighting capabilities that did not exist when space was treated as a, a benign domain. And so what that means in practice is that the Space Force has a lot of new start capabilities and a lot of NASA programs that, that need funding increases, which this CR kind of puts the kibosh on. And you see this across the board, as, as Doug sort of highlighted with, with all those programs. You know, all of those things have, have, to have to be delayed. And I think that hurts the service first and foremost in terms of delivering the capabilities warfighters need. But I also think bureaucratically, you know, the Space Force is unfortunately still fighting at this point this sort of rearguard action of justifying its existence. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, you know, even those inclined to support the new service, they sort of looked at the first two years of the Space Force as a grace period to sort of lay the foundations for a new service. But but now they're looking for some tangible results. And so this continual resolution really hurts in that regard. And the other thing I'd mention is briefly is just the highlighting the, uh, the service transfers, right? So the CR delays the transfer of capabilities from other services into the Space Force, such as the uh, uh, narrowband and wideband SATCOM from the Navy and Army, respectively. And this really undercuts another major objective of the Space Force, uh, which is the consolidation and better rationalization of space capabilities within a single organization. Yeah, Slick, let me wrap this up from a macro level. Uh, congressional actions in this regard really indicate that the Congress of the United States of America does not recognize just how severe of a deficit the United States military is relative to China. And by delaying the implementation of efforts to try to catch up, now remember, we're two decades behind China's advanced technological and military growth because we wasted those two decades focused on eating soup with a knife or counterinsurgency operations. So what this all ultimately might lead to is the United States military getting defeated in the next major regional conflict that we're in. So this is serious stuff, uh, and it's unfortunate that there's not more awareness on Congress's part, much less the American people. Yeah, sir, I appreciate that macro level. And, you know, as we all know, especially the defense insiders and all the services is how important, uh, you know, getting this budget thing squared away. But I do want to transition quickly to uh, something that is dominating the news today, and that is one word, Ukraine. So uh, with an incursion into eastern Ukraine becoming a likely outcome, how far do we think Putin's going to go? So General Tapula, I want to have you put your strategist hat on. And how do you read the cards that are in play right now? Well, it's an interesting question, and obviously everybody's got a different opinion on the topic. But I'd tell you that only Putin knows for sure uh, 
Uh, and, and even he might not have yet formulated his uh, end game, uh, waiting to see uh, some of the inputs that are coming from the U.S. and uh, NATO countries. Um, that said, there are a couple of realities here that define just how uh, the U.S. and her NATO allies might respond. And the biggest factor, it's an obvious one, but it is the biggest factor, is Ukraine's not a member of NATO. So there is no Article 5 defense of Ukraine on the table. Uh, now, some NATO members are stepping up with uh, military aid and assistance, as is the United States. But to date, the military assistance we're offering is pretty modest. Um, of course, the United States has threatened uh, serious consequential sanctions against Russia if they do elect to invade. Um, I would tell you that an escalation against Russian interests around the world shouldn't be a polite game of diplomatic and financial tit for tat. Uh, if, if the Western powers intend to pressure the Russian elites to dissuade Putin from war, then they better mean it. Uh, not only for Putin, but for everyone around him, including his underbosses who don't have Putin's political and financial resources to protect themselves and who therefore would face real costs in uh, personal losses. Now, President Biden's tried to say something along these lines, but the Russians understandably shrug off threats because they've heard these kinds of things from the Americans before. And I'm talking pretty directly here, but Putin's advisors are no doubt smiling confidently at a White House staff that they're already familiar with and whose last bold move on Ukraine back in 2014, the White House response was to run a hashtag campaign on Twitter. So and unless the West has the will to inflict serious economic punishment on the Russian elites, the only path out is by a diplomatic move where Washington publicly refuses to accept Russia's unreasonable demands, but at the same time finds a way to craft a compromise between the U.S. and Russia, between Russia and Ukraine, and between the United States and its European allies. Uh, through all of this, the Biden administration has cycled through virtually every combination of threats in an attempt to deter the Russians from attacking. But the reality of all of this is Putin created this crisis and only Putin can end it. Yeah, that is a great point, sir. So Heather, over to you. Do you see the risk regarding what's happening in Ukraine and how China might uh, interpret it? Slick, I'll tell you how China is likely viewing what's going on in the Ukraine right now. They're seeing this as a dress rehearsal for how the West might respond to Taiwan. And a major difference between Russia and China and the power that they leverage regarding what the White House right now is threatening against Russia, right, economic sanctions, is that really the United States does not have the power to be able to do that against China. So if the West and the United States really kind of backs down on, on Ukraine with what's going on with Putin right now, I think we've seen a very clear path for how China can then move forward and accomplish that fait accompli uh, for Taiwan that, that for a long time we've, we've all been wringing our hands over, right? Because that would be a, a major shift in not just global power, but moving towards a major shift in global order. So I think this is really kind of the, the big problem. And then if we do see Putin advance into the Ukraine and the West getting uh, militarily in, involved there, I think we'll also see a major vulnerability open up within the Pacific because the United States simply does not have the force structure, the inventory, and the personnel. We are not sized to be able to handle two simultaneous conflicts. So this is a very dangerous time right now for us strategically uh, on the global stage. I'm going to open this up for everybody, just really focusing in on air and space. Uh, how do air and space play into the equation uh, for this and, and specifically shaping Putin's decision calculus? Well, I tell you what, they play an enormous role just given the assets that we have today uh, in the context of collecting intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance information and providing intelligence to the Ukrainians as a byproduct of our air and space-based uh, 
ISR capabilities. Um, that's probably a, an enormous advantage that air and space power provide relative to this particular situation. Because uh, as mentioned before, we're not going to get involved with force application on the part of the Ukrainians if this goes kinetic. Um, we'll provide them weapons. Uh, again, to date, we really haven't done that much. But the ISR and intelligence piece is a very, very important role. And uh, I think that might make the Russians think twice as well. And I also think it's important to highlight here, it's all a matter of politics at this point in escalation. If we actually wanted to employ kinetically, obviously we'd have some pretty significant advantages in in this equation. The real concern is, is escalation with another nuclear power and broader issues. But I just want to circle back to what Heather was saying. If you want to have peace in the rest of the world for the out years, what we do here, you just can't overstate it. And uh, this is one where we, we really need to dial in. Yeah, remember, we're in the What's going on in the Pentagon right now in the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy's office is the construction of the next version of the national defense strategy. You know, and, and that has to be pragmatic. Uh, it can't just be a strategy that's driven by budget, which is the way that this nation has been executing defense strategy for the last 30 years. Uh, that's got to change. To jump on that... Um, This gets back to what we've seen Mark Gunzinger on our team with Gonzo says about crafting that next national defense strategy. This is exactly that kind of case which needs to have a simultaneous conflict be the sizing paradigm for the national defense strategy and, and what we do going forward. And even if there are no kinetic operations, the United States does not get militarily involved, which hopefully that's the case. This should be something that scares senior leaders within the DOD and within the administration and brings them to their senses that we are too small as an Air Force, certainly too small as a, fa- as a space force, and too small overall, as well as not being appropriately balanced for what the future will hold. So, I mean, as, as Gonzo has said before, if we think about a conflict in, in Europe and a conflict in China, what does that mean regarding that balance? Well, the armies probably needs to be sized for the European theater. The Navy probably needs to be sized primarily for the Pacific theater. But the Air Force and the Space Force have to be sized for both. Yeah, that's a great point, Heather. And one thing I was going to add, too, is they're building this out. They have a new service, obviously, the Space Force to build into their calculus. So it's going to be much different uh, this time around. So, And I do want to focus uh, over to uh, to Lucas. The Mitchell Institute's uh, obviously been attracting the senior most leadership in the Department of the Air Force. In addition to the secretary, we posted the Chief Space Operations General Raymond last week. So what are the main themes that you heard from him from a uh, space front? Thanks, Slick, for the question. And, you know, it was really great having General Raymond here at Mitchell. And uh, if you haven't watched the event, uh, anyone out there listening, I'd strongly encourage you to check it out. I think it was a really great uh, hour that we had with him. But uh, I'll just mention a couple major themes that stuck out to me from, from his comments. Um, and I think the, the first has to do with force design. You know, I think that's really the most important area where the Space Force um, has already done some really good work, but then something that going into year three now is going to be a, a big priority. So, They've already gone through sort of one iteration with missile warning, missile tracking, that mission set, in terms of figuring out, having all the pieces in place to actually build that force design and sort of think through that problem set. And and I think the feedback from that so far has been been fairly positive. So this year, they're going to also be looking at tactical ISR uh, and then the data transport layers, two other mission sets that they're going to focus on. And there's a lot that goes into that, you know, including how they engage with industry earlier in the process, uh, how they integrate commercial capabilities, ally capabilities. And I think these are some of the things that they've already worked through with that sort of initial go at it with the missile warning thing and that they're going to continue to do now with these other problem sets. Um, so I think that's going to feature really prominently. Um, but then also, of course, you know, how do you take that force design and think through how it gets implemented through the acquisition process? There's been some progress in that area. Uh, But I think one thing in particular to note is the upcoming integration of the Space Development Agency into the Space Force. I know a lot of people are anxiously awaiting to see how that uh, plays out in terms of acquisition authorities and how that's all going to pan out. So something certainly to watch in the the upcoming year. 
I, I think another major theme was the space domain and the space force uh, being featured more prominently uh, in future strategy documents. You know, I think uh, a lot of people, including myself, were, were a bit surprised when space wasn't mentioned in the recently released Global Posture Review. But I'm, I'm hopeful, based on General Raymond's remarks, that, that space will play a bigger role in the upcoming national defense strategy, the joint warfighting concept, um, among other you know, documents that are going to be released soon. And then the last thing I'll mention is, is the intelligence piece. You know? And this really goes back to uh, recognizing space as a warfighting domain like any other. You know, I think the Space Force has done a lot in terms of operational intelligence to help ensure its operators have the information they need to understand the domain in which they're operating and the threats that are out there. You know, so having a space delta now that is focused on intelligence and then having sort of mission-focused attachments that are assigned to other space squadrons. Uh, so, so John Raymond was, was emphasizing having those intel experts co-located with, with other operators, which I think is, is promising. Um, but then also in terms of strategic intelligence, with the stand-up of the National Space Intelligence Center. And I think that's something that we think is a, a really encouraging sign as well, sort of to help foster that strategic uh, intelligence analysis capability. Yeah, there's so much going on with the Space Force, and it's great that it's getting out front and center. What areas do you think need to be uh, added to the space dialogue in 2022? Yeah, I think uh, the thing that foremost comes to mind is the need to have a, a more open discussion about the need for offensive space capabilities that can hold our adversaries' constellations at risk. There's a huge focus right now on making our own constellations and capabilities more resilient. And, and that's absolutely critical, don't get me wrong. But I think you can't have an effective deterrent strategy that centers solely around the defensive side of the equation. Uh, you also have to be able to hold things your adversary cares about or values or risk. Um, and that sort of leads into a second point, which is making more progress in terms of declassification. So space is uniquely overclassified. Uh, I think you've heard this from a lot of senior leaders, and I think that ultimately hurts its deterrent value because if your adversary doesn't know that you have certain capabilities, then how can they possibly be deterred by them? So in terms of offensive capabilities, it's not just about having them, but also demonstrating them. And, and we're not talking about in a, in a reckless manner like what you're seeing with the Russian and Chinese ASAT tests and, and not, you know, handing over the blueprint of the capability. But I think, you know, offering sufficient information so that people get the point of what it can do. So I think, you know, the B-21 is a really great example of sort of what we're talking about here. And then just a third thing quickly is just talking more about those supporting, supported relationships when it comes to space. I think too often the conversation currently surrounds, you know, what the Space Force can do to better support other services or domains, whether that's providing communication support, intel, or, or, or whatever. So one of the things that really stuck out to me from, from General Goldfein's doctrine note that he put out in all domain operations was the fact that these supporting support relationships in the future would be very fluid. And so thinking about how some of the other domains and, and services can, can provide support to the Space Force to make sure that they can get done what they need to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, especially with your first point. You know, I feel like we need some force in the Space Force. So the offensive uh, capability is going to be something that I uh, hope gets a lot of focus. But I do want to open up uh, the question to, to everybody else as far as what we need to be looking at for the Space Force in 2022. Yeah, well, uh, w the same things we should have been looking out for the Space Force in 2021 and 2020. And that's one, sufficient resources to be able to execute the demands that are placed on the Space Force and why it was stood up for in the first place. Two, making sure it has sufficient numbers of personnel to execute the mission. And number three, to date, there have been zero of the multiple other space organizations out there consolidated inside the Space Force. So folks shouldn't forget these three critical elements that are absolutely required to ensure that the Space Force is set up for success. That's kind of a big old mic drop right there, sir. <laughs> well, we got to hammer home on these things because otherwise, try as, as hard as they can, they're not going to be able to execute the, the, the macro level objective for why they've been stood up unless those three things occur. I absolutely agree. But, you know, building off of some of the things that Lucas was talking about regarding the declassification and the supported supporting relationships between a space force and other domains, this is a, a place where I think we need to move uniquely forward in the Air Force is beginning to develop operational concepts and tactics, techniques and procedures and the technology that supports that to enable the air domain to operate more closely in an integrated way with the space domain. And I'm not just talking about treating the space domain like it's the cable guy and they're giving us GPS and SATCOM. That's not the case at all. It's about actually having that integrated 
defensive and offensive operations. All right. Well, hey, we're getting a little bit short on time, but I do want to open up the floor for any parting shots. Think about uh, what top issues we may be hearing about in the coming weeks in, in the next month or so. I'd say first off, you know, it's all about U.S. credibility. We just got done losing Afghanistan. If we lose Ukraine right on top of it, it's going to set off a cascade of events we really don't want to see. And with the budget coming out, if the numbers fall, if you see things like F-35 drop, space investments drop, all of that, uh, that's very concerning. And then really discipline on roles and missions is going to be huge coming out in this budget. If you see things like a million entities playing in long-range fires and all of that uh, at tremendous cost, inefficiency, and reduced effectiveness, uh, they're not getting real where they need to because the top line's not going to grow. The only way we're going to get the resources we need is be smarter about where we're allocating for best mission effect. Yeah, um, let me translate. You know, there was an old joke back about 20, 30 years ago about uh, what the captain really means. Uh, some of you old craniums might remember that. But um, what the executive director of the Mitchell Institute means is that we shouldn't be wasting my, uh, manpower, time, and resources developing uh, hypersonic ground launch missiles in the Army that cost 45 to $55 million a shot when we can do that for a fraction of the cost developing uh, air-launched missiles. Okay, let me jump in here to answer your question. We talked about Russia, but how about China? While we'll continue to keep an eye on Taiwan and the South China Sea, um, everybody needs to watch out for an incident that could quickly escalate with a U.S. ally, um, especially in light of the tension with Russia. North Korea. North Korea has now conducted five missile tests this year. That's more than one a week. And it's claimed that it also successfully tested a hypersonic weapon now, you know, uh, you know given uh, Korea's uh, r track record on uh, accuracy, uh, they put a big question mark behind that. But while we expect that Kim's following the playbook of testing and ratcheting up tensions to bring the U.S. back to the table to discuss sanctions relief, um, do we think that Kim's going to continue to act out in 2022 to, to try to get that relief and recognition that he's looking for? And then, of course, there's Iran. As the nuclear talks continue to drag on, um, the recent attacks by pro-Iranian militia on U.S. personnel and assets in the region continue. Uh, in addition, Iranian-backed Houthi rebels for the first time attacked the UAE. So are the Iranians using the fact that the U.S. and Europe are distracted to uh, increase their leverage? So just a couple of other things that uh, we want to keep an eye on. All right. Well, team, that's all we have time for today. But I really want to say thanks so much for uh, being here and sharing the thoughts. And it, it's crazy to think that this is the first rendezvous of 2022 because it already feels like January has been a year long. But uh, just want to uh, remind our guests to sign up to watch uh, General Deptula uh, have his discussion with uh, Secretary Kendall on February 15th. So that's uh, on um, our website. So it will be a link in the show notes. And uh, meanwhile, the best to everybody and uh, your families. Thanks, Slick. Thanks, thanks JB. Thanks, Slick. I hey, appreciate it, man. Thank you, our listeners, for your continued support, and thank you for tuning in today. We've got a lot of new and exciting content coming your way, and this year, we're headed out to Air and Space events near you, so don't forget to follow or subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn to find out where we'll be and what the Mitchell team has in our site picture. And please don't forget to leave us a rating, hit the like button, and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. Also, leave us a comment to let us know what you think about our podcast and let us know areas you think we should explore further. Please visit us at mitchellaerospacepower.org to read the latest reports, events, and analysis that are charting the vectors for our air and space forces. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.